Hello and welcome to Speak Up, Listen Up, Follow Up, the podcast from the National Guardian's office. This October, the National Guardian's office celebrates our sixth annual Speak Up month. Our theme for this year is Breaking Freedom to Speak Up Barriers. As part of the Awareness Month, we'll be hearing from guests with their own Speak Up stories and reflecting on how we can break the barriers they faced to make a better and safer speaking up culture across healthcare in England. In this episode, Dr. Jane Chichi clark National Guardian for the NHS, will be in conversation with Peter Duffy, MBE. Peter is an established surgeon of 35 years and won his Trust's Doctor of the Year Award in 2016. In 2015, he spoke up to the Care Quality Commission against colleagues when there were numerous concerns of clinical negligence. In 2016, he was forced to resign after a subsequent peer dispute, demotion, allegations of racism and threats of a respective pay cut. He took the University Hospitals of Morecambe and Bay NHS Trust to an employment tribunal in 2018. He was found to be wrongly dismissed and awarded compensation. But this did not stop, as he describes, a forced exile to the Isle of Man, working a hospital there, away from family in Lancaster. Peter now campaigns for a safer NHS and has written two books on his experience. If you'd like to find out more about Peter's speaking up story, please watch the video linked in the show notes. Whistleblowers are your greatest friend. They're your canary in the coal mine that will tell you when things are starting to go wrong. We hope you enjoyed this episode and now over to Jane. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, It's a real privilege to sit and have an opportunity to talk with you. I know we've met before and your case, your experience, it's not a case, it's your lived experience of speaking up and the consequences that, uh, that befell you as a consequence of that. You have written extensively about, you've talked very powerfully about. And what I'd like to do today is really explore with you some of the learning that our listeners will be able to take away from that incredible incredibly um, awful experience that you had. And I want to just set, I started to say that no worker, be they doctor, nurse, porter, office worker, no worker when they speak up for saying, for doing the right thing, should suffer negative consequences. So we want to learn from what would make it better. So can I just start off with my generic question, which is what does freedom to speak up mean to you? Freedom to speak up to me um, would simply mean being able to safeguard and to uh, protect vulnerable people, whether they be patients or staff, uh, without fear of retaliation or recriminations or the usual sequence of uh, detriments that you and I know very well whistleblowers are, are often subject to. Thank you. That's a very succinct but meaningful definition for you. And I think for many listeners, they will resonate with that. Um, And sadly, although some people um, and some organisations and some leaders get this very right and will take information um, that comes to them from their their workers, whether they be feeling that they're formally whistleblowing or just raising a matter of concern or just feel like they're they're speaking about matters that is just doing the right thing. That is so important, isn't it? Because I sometimes think we we sort of mystify the freedom to speak up um, label a bit and it shouldn't be mystified. For, for me, you know, freedom to speak up is about being able to say in your organisation what gets in the way of, of, of doing your job. And when it relates particularly to patient safety, that is absolutely vital. Um, so I wonder if you could explore a little bit for us what barriers, because in this Speaking Up month, we're looking at barriers to speaking up. What barriers did you face when you spoke up back in Morecambe Bay those years ago? Um, I guess there's a series of barriers, really, because this all goes back for me to the early um, 2000s. I mean, first of all, there's the instinctive um, hesitancy, isn't there, about this sort of thing? You don't want to cause trouble. You don't want to create issues for a colleague. Um, There were concerns as well. I mean, the issues I was speaking up about were really quite serious, even, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And I was concerned about the well-being of the uh, the family and the dependence of the person I had concerns about. So all this is really quite 
inhibitory, really. And I, I was worried that there would be retaliation, although I was terribly naive in those days, knowing what I know now. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't so naive as to not expect and not to be warned that there was likely to be retaliation. Um, so, so I think that was the initial um, hesitancy that I suffered from. Um, and that certainly inhibited me from doing what I finally did, which was going outside the organization. It took another probably 10 years plus until I, I did that. And I had to be essentially pushed into it by uh, an act of disobedience to our, our local coroner over an avoidable death, which, which, which crossed the line for me. And despite my reservations uh, and my inhibitions, I felt at that point, since we had essentially, in my opinion, at least uh, committed an act of contempt of court, I really did need to go outside the organization because it was clear uh, that the organization itself was not going to act on that. So I, I hope that that answers the question that you, you're just you're always inhibited by this sense of not wanting to cause trouble. And I think for a lot of whistleblowers, sooner or later, there comes a point, doesn't there, where a line is crossed and then you do speak up. And then it's almost as though things gain a momentum all of themselves. Absolutely. And I think that's just hearing that length of time for you to wrestle with, you know, clearly very important patient safety issues that you felt you need to speak up about what was getting in the way. And of course, back then, there wasn't the additional route of a freedom to speak up guardian. And, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I don't know and you won't know. And I'm, I'm not necessarily going to ask you to comment on would that additional route have potentially provided any additional support for you internally? Uh, you know, but whatever you felt a need and you had the courage and it does take an enormous amount of courage to speak up externally. Um, and I just wonder whether we could talk a little um, about what you think needs to change. So based on your experience, how do we make speaking up business as usual? Um, you know, how could we put systems in place that prevent something like happen to you? your experience, your lived experience, stopping that happening again? Yeah, um, for me, um, it's about culture change across the whole organisation. Um, so a lot of people have talked to me about, you know, bad apples and what should happen to individuals who were involved in this. But it goes far higher and further than that. This is not an issue of a few rogue individuals. I think we both know that this is um, a culture which goes across the whole NHS and I think you only need to look at the Lucy Letby case to see once again whistleblowing and whistleblower retaliation creeping into the decision making that went on there. So I think there needs to be a change in culture. I think that historically whistleblowers have been seen as disloyal. Um, I was described just the other day as being, oh yeah, that was anti-establishment. And that's wrong. Uh, I mean, this this is somebody who is um, a friend. I'm not anti-establishment. I'm quite the opposite. Absolutely. I'm trying to do here is to uphold the establishment. And so people, I think, who are whistleblowers need to be seen as uh, endorsing and trying to protect the reputation of their organization, of trying to uphold the law. Uh, and are trying to make sure that our establishment, whether it be the NHS or other public sector, or for that matter, private sector bodies, run on an ethical, moral, safe basis. And from that point of view, whistleblowers are your greatest friend. They're your canary in the coal mine that will tell you when things are starting to go wrong, yet we're so often demonised and destroyed, ultimately, in order to keep the lid on potential scandal. And coming back to the Lucy Letby case, we saw that very clearly there, didn't we? It does feel shocking that someone can, you know, um, accuse you of being anti-establishment. And I say accuse because clearly, you know, that was a very powerful statement someone made to you that has, has given rise to your feeling about that. And I would, if someone said that to me, absolutely agree with you that people who speak up, if people identify as a whistleblower and not everyone who speaks up about a matter might think they're a whistleblower. And I, 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 so I use the terms, you know, whistleblowing 
speaking up matter, raising a concern all interchangeably, um, because actually what matters is that there's this gift of information, isn't there, that as someone who works in an organisation, you're giving your leadership team um, or your manager if you're you know if you're raising it initially you know to to your line manager and what really worries me is the case upon case we keep seeing um, in 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 the public domain of where reputational damage uh, limitation comes before doing the right thing and listening to what someone's saying with curiosity, listening with real intent. What what could this information be be giving us? What 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 in here do I really need to take action on and and investigate some more? And I think sometimes, you know, from from and we need to wait for the inquiry in terms of the Lucy Letby case to to really help us understand in more detail what inhibited people in leadership positions taking earlier action after concerns were repeatedly appears from what I've read raised. But I'm really mindful of this, this defence being the first port of call rather than, gosh, could we be getting this wrong? Or even, you know, a different response to, say, you coming to me and saying, Jane, I'm really worried about such and such in my, you know, related to patient safety or, you know, worker safety and saying, gosh, what's that telling me and how can I improve it? Um, now, I, I worry with that, that still risk averse that yes we say that there's got to be major um, cultural change uh, but how do we enact that we've had frameworks we've had review after review which has similar recommendations but I wonder if you've got any insight from your experience as to what uh, what systemic changes we might need to make? Is it in the education of our leaders? Is it into the recruitment of values around this that's going to be so essential? Um, I mean, I don't have all the answers at all. I just know we've all got to be collectively looking together to say enough. What are we going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Yes, well, I'm not sure I have all the answers either. Um, so I've, I've mentioned culture change. And I think that really does need to be led right from the very top. So we're not just talking here about chief executives and chairs and so on. We're talking about NHS England. We're talking about the CQC. We're talking about in medical cases of whistleblowing the GMC. And I think all the way up to the Department of Health and Social Care and the Office for the Secretary of State for Health. It really does need to be driven from the absolute top. And I think that we need to get away from a culture where um, senior managers and executives are rewarded for keeping things quiet on their watch and moving more towards a system where people at that sort of level uh, feel that they can take uh, rapid and uh, decisive action over potential wrongdoing without it potentially affecting their own careers. So the whole ethos and atmosphere and culture needs to change right from the very top downwards and people need to realize I think that by taking the easy route which is often suppressing whistleblowing and closing things down all too often just simply stores up a far bigger scandal two or three years down the line um, and I think the other thing and we, we perhaps will touch a little bit here upon the sort of registration of senior managers and executives is um, I don't think we should really allow this culture to continue where people sense a scandal coming up, can quickly duck out of their jobs and pop up somewhere else or take early retirement or something. There does need to be a holding to account. So as well as the, the carrot of, of encouraging positive uh, culture change, you do, I think, need a bit of a stick um, so that people know that they will be held responsible where things go wrong. I think you're absolutely right. And it is that balance, isn't it, between a, 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 you know, we talk about a just and learning culture, but at the same time, having accountability as well. And um, I think that's going to be a really important area to look at and strengthen. We have the new framework coming out of NHS England for the implementation of the um, Fit and Proper Persons Test, which um, increases um, the, um, the accountability within there and sanctions to take including if leaders are found to have been suppressing you know whistleblowers people who speak up um, and it will be important to see how that is strengthened in practice um, because as you say that's you know that's the that's the learning from when it doesn't go well 
actually ensuring that 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 there's a, a just way of accountability around actions. But I'm really interested in your um, in your comment about the, the 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 sea change needed in hearts and minds from the very top down. I wonder how often we think about well, we can't take that that news of that to our seniors or you know be that within an organization or an organization escalating to a regulator or or higher because of that not wanting to be seen as not doing everything right you know and also that that feeling of um of potentially of some leaders at that level I, I don't want to hear any bad news just yeah. tell me the good um and it's about turning that on its head because actually the more we can have candor um, and the more we can have openness around where we've still got to learn, and that includes, you know, significant patient harm, but on 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 lower level issues where we need to say, actually, we haven't got this right and we're working to improve. I think then certainly um, people who work in the, in the NHS and wider will feel um, more confident about the supportive environment and really importantly, patients and the public, patients and their families and the public who use our services will think, ah, you know, I'm going to have much more trust and support in what's going on. Um, and we've got a long way to go with implementation of duty of candour, um, and, and we all recognise that. Um, and I know that CQC are working on um, a potential new regulation around the duty to listen. And actually, that's so important that we absolutely insist that leaders and managers listen to matters that people are bringing to them and act in a timely and just manner. And I think there is a fear, isn't there, of, um, well, if I get this wrong because um, I investigate and then the individual I'm investigating because of whatever matters have brought to light, you know, takes me to industrial tribunal, etc. And there is that that worry of doing the wrong thing. But I think our, our processes, for example, for suspension as a neutral act um, whilst an investigation is happening, is not easy, um, and it needs to be done in a very um, in a very measured and considerate, compassionate way. But nonetheless, it needs doing at times because Ooh. otherwise, as we as we know, significant patient harm, including death, um, can happen. So we've got a long way to go, haven't we? Um, and it's no quick fix. But if we don't keep talking about it and looking at the structures to support it, then um, we're we're never going to try and turn the turn the tide of it. I wonder as I'm thinking, we're probably coming to the end of our um, of our session. If I could ask you if you've got any pearls of wisdom to conclude our conversation today around advice to a manager within a team or a leader within an organisation. What are two or three key things that you think is imperative to help them embed a really robust speaking up culture, one that's welcomed and embraced? OK, well, I think you you touched on probably the top one just there when you said it's not easy. Um, when you're dealing with um, whistleblowing or safeguarding issues and so on. And it, it isn't easy, which I think is why all too often um, people uh, attempted to go down the route of least resistance, which is to just cover things up or ignore them. Um, the bottom line is that we all have an overriding responsibility to um, patients, and to the service itself to provide a safe environment and that should override everything and it doesn't really matter I think how difficult it may be to act on these things um, if somebody brings serious safeguarding issues to you then act on them you must it's your moral duty it's your professional duty and it's enshrined in your duties I should imagine in your NHS contract if you're a manager that you are obliged to act in defence of safe patient care. Um, so um, I would say, yeah, sometimes life involves taking the difficult route, but you should not shirk from it when patients' health and safety is at risk. Thank you, Peter, so much. I think that is a, um, a really powerful message to finish on, and it's been a, a really great opportunity to explore further with you um, your thoughts about your experiences. And I hope our listeners have enjoyed um, and found it stimulating. Food for thought, Peter. There's a long way to go. It's not easy, but let's not um, let's not take the easy. Let's take the right route. 
Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. We welcome your feedback, so please like, rate and comment. Thanks for listening.